In this video, we're going to continue our um, talk about system design and we're going to talk about duct components and noise. Now again, this is the basics. So uh, when you start doing sheet metal and duct design, you're going to go into a lot more depth on this. So let's start off with the simple idea of a few duct components, okay? And we want to talk about elbows first, okay? Because elbows are 90 degree bends in ducts and airflow is diverted from a straight line using elbows. Air has inertia. Once air is set in motion, air continues in a straight line. Air wants to flow in this straight line. It takes energy to make this airflow change direction. Now, why are we starting off with talking about elbows? Because elbows are used very, very frequently in ducts, and a lot of elbows are installed as very sharp angles, like 90 degrees. I've seen elbows installed even to 290 degrees together to get 180 degrees. Okay, but we want to use as few elbows and as wide of range is as available. So if you can use a 45 degree elbow instead of a 90, okay, you're going to be much better off in terms of airflow because every time we change direction of airflow, we're re going to reduce the airflow by a certain percentage. Okay, so we, when we're looking at elbows, okay, we have the ability to use a short radius elbow. So that's a very tight turn. And you notice how the airflow in this, okay, starts becoming turbulent, okay? A long radius elbow allows the, that's a more wide sweeping turn, allows the airflow to continue to be smooth, okay? You can do a short radius, if you put veins, okay, pieces of metal in here that help direct the air to continue in a straight path. We have the same thing with a T. If you come in with a standard T, okay, 90 degree here, 90 degree there, okay, the air is going to continue in a straight line and it's going to want to bounce off this far wall across from the T. And it's going to cause all sorts of turbulation in here. However, if you do a modified T, you see how we've created a sweeping bend, okay, here? The air is going to continue smoothly. Now, that's important as we continue to talk about airflow and duct design, and as well as noise, because anytime you have turbulence, okay, the air will make noise. And a lot of people in offices as well as residences, okay, are very susceptible to duct noise. They will hear it and you'll get complaints on it. Airflow is generally produced by some type of fan that is usually located in the inlet of an air conditioner. Air is moving, moved by creating a positive or negative pressure. The air inlet to the fan is a negative pressure. The exhaust out of the fan is a positive pressure. And in the picture above, we have some little YouTube manometers up here, okay? So everything, this is the open space, pressures are equal, okay? And C, pressures are equal. But in the return side, which is the A side of the fan, we pull, okay? It creates a little bit of a vacuum. In the B side, we create a positive pressure because we're pushing air out, so return is always negative. Supply is always positive. Air feed into the fan is called induced draft. Exhaust from the fan is called forced draft. Fans are constructed of either metal or plastic. There are several types of fans, but the two most popular are an axial flow, looks like a propeller, and a radial flow that's centrifugal. Air flowing along the direction that the axle is pointing is called axial flow. Air flowing at a right angle to the axle, radio, is called radial flow. So we have two types of fans here, okay? And you can actually recognize some of the usages for this. Okay, the left one is radial flow. Okay, we're pulling air in the side and we're or pushing it out the side and we're blowing it at a 90 degree angle. You see how we have a 90 degree, we're pulling air in, we're blowing at a 90 degree. This could actually be reversed if you were looking at it from a blower, okay? This is like a indoor fan motor on an AC system. We're pulling in air in from the sides, 
and we're pushing out at a 90 degree angle down the ductwork or in through the heat exchanger. Okay, this would be like what you would see in the most common description is a condenser fan motor. Okay, or the fan blades. You have the fan blades and you're pushing along the shaft, okay? Because if you hold your hands over the top of the condenser, you're going to feel air blowing out. It's with the shaft. Okay, this is a three-blade axial flow fan with a clockwise rotation. Axial flow fans are usually direct driven by mounting the fan blades on the motor shaft. Again, think about a condenser fan blade that's sitting at the top of an AC condenser or heat pump. Handle the blades carefully. If they're bent or twisted, the blades must be replaced. These things can get off balance, and if they're off balance, they won't work properly and they'll make a lot of noise. Radial flow fans are most often used on large installations or, okay, in any type of air handler or residential air handler furnace, anything where we need to move um, air quickly down ductwork. Now, we don't often see in residential the belt-driven fans anymore. More of these are direct drives, but this is just an example. They can be belt or direct drive. Okay, there are some fan designation. A low pressure, which is considered a class one fan, is less than three and three quarter inches. Okay, medium pressure, class two, would be three and three quarter to six and three quarter inches. High pressure, class three, would be six and three quarter or 12 and one quarter to one and quarter inches. And high pressure, class four, is greater than 12 and a quarter inches. And by the way, that's water column. That's the pressures. There's two designs of radial flow fans. You have backward inclined blades, it's for larger units, or forward inclined blades for smaller units. This is just, just how the blades are turned on the blower wheel. Okay, Depends on how you're catching and pulling the air. Static pressure flow increases as the square... Uh, as the square of the ratio of increase in volume of airflow. For example, 1,000 CFM to 2,000 CFMs is two times more flow. Therefore, 22 equals 2 times 2 equals 4 times more static pressure. Static pressure increases is the square of the ratio of change of RPM. Okay? There's two ways to measure performance, actually multiple ways to measure performance of a fan. You can use the pressure difference across the fan. That's inlet velocity pressure equals outlet velocity pressure. Okay, static pressure is another way, velocity pressure, static pressure difference. And some technicians measure prefer to measure pressure relative to room pressure. There's no right or wrong way to do it as long as it matches as long as you do it the same way every time. For radial flow fans, you can determine the fan capacity by looking at the BTU per hour furnace output CFM, okay, times the air temperature rise in degree Fahrenheit. Air temperature rise in degree Fahrenheit is determined by measuring the warm air supply plenum temperature and subtracting the cold air return temperature. For cooling, we use 400 CFM per ton of capacity. Okay, the total pressure drop in the duct should be about 0.2 inches of water column. For furnace with a cooling unit, the fan should provide 0.1 inches of water column. But again, always look at the nameplate on the unit. And this up here, there's a slight correction on this formula, okay, that we do have to put in here because um, something vanished on my um, slide here. Okay, it's 1.065 times delta T. 
To provide more efficient belt drive, belt tension should be lower on lower belt sections. Okay, so we want the tension to be on the lower, but there should be some slack. Okay, you don't want a you don't want very very heavy slack because the belt can wear out. It will not work properly. Belt tension is correct when the belt can be pushed out of line, a distance equal to its width. So if you have a quarter inch belt, you should be able to push it out of line a quarter inch. Half inch belt, be able to push it out of line half inch. Fan speed can be varied using adjustable or variable pitch pulleys. As fans collect dirt and lint, they reduce efficiency. Every six months, we want to reduce, remove the fan, scrape, rub, or vacuum the dirt from the blades. Oil each bearing with one or two drops of oil each year. If the bearings are oiled too much, the oil may coat the fan blades. Now, always check because a lot of the motors and pulleys we see now actually do not require oil. They're sealed bearings that come pre-oiled. So just, just always look. If there's an oil port, it needs oil. For very large commercial systems, they're still grease fittings, and you have to make sure they get greased. If ducts are not concealed, they may need to be painted on occasion. Okay, Ducts made of galvanized zinc-coated steel must be treated prior to painting. Duct systems shouldn't have any dead ends where dust and stagnant air may collect. Reversing the airflow may loosen some of the ducts that can then be caught in the filter. Periodic duct cleaning should occur to maintain proper airflow. Aluminum to steel joint encourages corrosion due to the electrochemical action. Joints between dissimilar mesh metals should be avoided. City and state fire codes may require smoke detectors in residential and commercial structures. Detectors have to be properly located. High velocity air from ducts may keep detectors from working. If a long horizontal run of duct ends at an outlet grill that is not concealed, the smoke detector should be hung on the underside of the duct just behind the outlet grill. In residential systems, smoke detectors should be as far away from possible as grills as possible. Never place smoke detectors in corners where there is almost no airflow. It's useless. Two common problems with air distribution systems are noise, produced by the movement of vibration or vibration in drafts, okay? Three factors that affect noise are the noise source, the carrier for the noise, and noise amplifiers or reflectors. Noise can be a high-pitched sound, which is usually caused by air velocity that is too high, possibly due to sharp metal edges. A low-pitched rumble it's usually caused by fans or motor sounds that travel along the duct systems. Popping sounds as the unit starts or stops. It's caused by expansion and contraction of the duct. All of these issues can be resolved. To locate the source of the high-pitched sound, remove the grills or diffusers. If the noise stops, it was due to a sharp edge. Locate and correct the problem. Decibels are used to measure noise levels. Decibels, or dB, refers to the frequency of pressure fluctuations in the air, amplitude, or size of the vibration. Airborne sound is expressed in cycles per second. Sources of noise can be fans and motors, the high-velocity air tra traveling through ducts and causing turbulence, sucking and throbbing noises produced by compressors, high-velocity refrigerant flow, especially at sharp bends in the piping, Noise caused by high-speed air is often a result of undersized units or ducts. Rigid structures are noise or vibration carriers. High, hard, smooth surfaces in conditioned space may reflect or amplify sounds. Soft fabrics such as drapes, curtains, and fabric-covered furnitures are noise absorbers. Felt-lined, soft insulation-lined, and covered ducts also absorb noise. A lot of times in installations, you'll see a little bit of flexible duct being used prior to every um, damper or grill. Okay, this actually will absorb the noise. 
Also, if you use felt lined or soft insulation supply plenums, you can actually recover a lot of the noise or remove a lot of the fan noise and motor noise from the ductwork.